Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the USC Comedy Festival, Volume 5. I'm Alex Zago, Director of Programming at the USC School of Cinematic Arts. And on behalf of SCA, I'd like to welcome you to a weekend packed with many of our favorite comedians, new comic voices, and brand new short films from our talented student filmmakers. I'd like to thank USC Visions and Voices, the Arts and Humanities Initiative, that has generously sponsored all five editions of our biennial comedy festival, as well as our dedicated USC comedy faculty and staff. Please visit the USC Comedy Festival website, which I'll post in the chat, to learn about our other upcoming events this weekend, including panels featuring A.D. Bryant, Rami Youssef, Patton Oswalt, Ziwe Fumido, and many others, alongside our 2021 Jack Oakey and Victoria Horn Oakey Masters of Comedy Award recipient, Bill Hader. If you'd like to ask a question tonight, please type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen and we'll try and answer as many of them as we can. We also have a Comedy Festival Discord server running this weekend, which you can join at any time and I'll post that link in the chat as well. Tonight's panel discussion, Can Comedy Be Taught? featuring Matt Besser, Lisa Kudrow, and Dimitri Martin, will be hosted by the inimitable Wayne Fetterman, generously crossing the aisle over from the USC School of Dramatic Arts. Uh, enjoy the show, and please now welcome Barnett Kelman, Chair of our Division of Film and Television Production and the Robin Williams Endowed Chair in Comedy. Thanks, Alex. USC Comedy is a program offering instruction and mentorship to aspiring artists seeking to develop their comedy, their comedy skills in a university environment. When in 2011, with the support of Dean Elizabeth Daly, professors David Isaacs, Jack Epps, and I founded the program, we carefully avoided asking one question, can comedy be taught? Until tonight. Now at last we've assembled a crack team of experts to answer it for us. It's my pleasure to welcome and introduce these experts who need no introduction. Lisa Kudrow is an Emmy award-winning actor for her work on Friends. She's the creator of The Comeback and Web Therapy. She trained at the Groundlings and she's the recipient of USC Comedy's Oki Award for Lifetime Achievement in Comedy. Dimitri Martin is a writer and stand-up with numerous albums and comedy specials to his credit. He wrote for Conan O'Brien and was a regular performer on The Daily Show. He recently made his feature directorial debut with the film Dean, winner of the Founders Prize at the Tribeca Film Festival. Matt Besser is one of the founders of the Upright Citizens Brigade and co-author of UCB's Comedy Improvisation Manual. An actor, comedian, writer, and director, Matt and the UCB have had an extraordinary outsized influence on the generation of comedians making us laugh today. And to lead our discussion, Wayne Fetterman, actor, stand-up, podcaster, author of the most excellent recently released History of Stand-Up. He's the producer of the documentary, The Zen Diaries of Gary Shandling. He's a professor of comedy at the USC School of Dramatic Arts and a member of our USC comedy team. Wayne, I ask you and Lisa, Dimitri and Matt, can comedy be taught? Uh, thank you. Thank you for that uh, that question. I think the answer is yes. And we're going to wrap it up, guys. That was fun. Uh, so, yeah. See so you, man. Go, 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 go ahead. Uh, no, let's, Matt, you wrote a book, an actual instructional book on improv, right? You know I did. Yes. And I guess the question, I'm going to start with you just because you've written a book on it. Uh has that book been helpful to any student so far? <laughs> Wait, you wrote that book in one go, right? There was no preparation or anything. It was like true to- I improvised it onto paper and never looked back. Um, yeah, you know what? It took us six years to write that book. Uh, Matt Walsh, Ian Roberts, and uh, Joe Wengert um, was our editor, but uh, it, we tried to crystallize our curriculum into a book, and I think we did. And I don't, Wayne, my, my short answer to the theme tonight would be maybe you can't teach someone to be funny. Uh, people are kind of maybe born or maybe raised funny. That may be another debate, but uh, right. uh, I, there's skills of comedy and certainly improv. Uh, the first time I ever saw improv, I saw the Herald being done in Chicago. I saw Tim Meadows, Dave Koechner, and Chris Farley were all in that cast and all unknown at the time. 
right? At the end of the show, I said, uh, the fat guy won, right? I went up to someone, <laughs> the fat guy won, right? There's no winner, they told me. But I really wanted to know, I, I, I fancied myself someone who understood comedy and was doing pretty well as a stand-up, but I did not get wh- what, how they did what they were doing. Got it. I went up to Tim Meadows. I was like, all right, you guys wrote that and you pretended that you improvised it, right? Because you broke out in a song at that one point and all started singing a chorus together. How could you all know? I mean, that's impossible. It was like, don't bother me, but no, we... Uh... <laughs> No, but I and I had to jump in and there were so many skills to learn, so many opinions on how those skills are. All right. We're going to get uh, into done. we're going to get into all of that. I just want right. to go around quickly to the panel. First of all, I like that you look down the entire time when you're answering questions. That's incredible. Uh, Lisa, I don't even see you here, but you, 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 of course, were not even on a dramatic path until you decided to become an actress after graduating from Vassar. So I assume you think comedy can be taught. Let's I'm going to piggyback. Wait, is that because you're assuming that I wasn't funny until I got to the groundlings? No, but oh. I thought that that's what I, I heard. I, yeah, that's that's probably what I was thinking. Zing, Could man. you were by I'll, go ahead, Dimitri. What were you saying? I just said zing. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. Well, uh, well, first of all, do you think First of all, do you think you can teach comedy to someone who's not funny? Let's go there first. Yes, if they want to learn. Yeah, absolutely. I saw it happen in improv classes. Someone who had no, none of it at all. Not one of the, that light that's behind all funny people. They didn't think they had it. They were a working dramatic actor. Mm-hmm. And... I think just wanted to sharpen their sort of listening skills by taking improv classes. And, right. um, and, you know, halfway through, he said, God, I don't know how you and, you know, some other people are, you're funny. I'm just not funny. I said, but of, of course you could be funny. You're an actor. You listen and respond. Right. And that's really all it is. And then you just sort of exaggerate it. Just go with it. And I'm sure it'll be funny. And he did. And it was. So Love that's, I, I just need to tell a story about one of my accomplishments. Of course. Yeah. There's going to be many more. We have many more. We have about 45 minutes. Well, that's uh, the only one I have. <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Dimitri <laughs> Martin, you are, I think you're the only one that didn't take comedy classes at all. Is that correct? Right. Yes, I just want to say too, I, I, it was interesting hearing all of our intros because I never thought of this before, but showbiz is funny because at any point in your career, when people introduce you, it's like your obituary up to that point. <laughs> I was like, oh, cool. So if I die now, that's kind of what I got. That's what I right. did. You know, I'm, I'm in the, oh, known for, you may have known him for whatever. I didn't right. quite you know, do it yet. But anyway, it was, it was sort of inspiring and horrifying at the same, I was like, okay, cool, work harder. <laughs> um, for me, it was, yes, yeah, stand up coming up in New York and um, definitely sort of trial by fire, open mics. So on the show, did you ever think of taking an improv class or taking anything, any sort of comedy class? No, but um, I got to be at the UCB, the first New York UCB. I got to do a one man show there. And okay. probably did a couple of stand-up shows there, which was on 22nd Street. And this would have been around 2001 or 2002. Okay. And started to sort of be a barnacle on maybe the UCB scene. But I, in my head, it was very um, split, which I think was sort of an artificial split. But I was like, cool, I'm going to go do the stand-up rooms. And then this is one of the rooms I can perform in. But I'm not, um, I don't know. I was so focused on writing jokes and... I don't know why, but it's from a very writerly perspective for me. Mm -hmm. It was like when I was younger and maybe you guys can relate to this in a, my instincts would lead me to a joke, uh, whether I was uncomfortable or there was a silence or something, well, you know, it was just like a joke around with my friends or a church for me or whatever. Um, but then when standup came along, it was this other thing where the question was, can I premeditate this? Can I plan this? And sort of the opposite of improv in a way, can I like, really plan it 
and write it. And then it was like, how few words can I, it was a very nerdy approach, I'd say, that was not even like character or personality based, but it was purely content. Like, okay, cool, 12 words. I think the laughs here, you know, that kind of thing. Well, Weird. one of the one of the things that all of you, and because this is primarily for students at USC, all of you attended college and graduated undergraduate, I think, you went to Yale, is that right, Dimitri? Yes, Vassar. That's, that's how we say it. We we we. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 then Amherst. Am I did I get that right? And then, but Dimitri, you went on past that, right? Brief. Yes, I I thought I was going to be a lawyer from like seventh oh. grade or so. I I was like, cool, got it. Corporate right. law, which I didn't know what that was, but that had a ring to it. This is the eighty, <laughs> so I thought, yes, corporate law, perfect. You know, I'll do it. Right. Um, I'm from Jersey Shore, which I think I should mention as sort of um, that should handicap me a little bit. So you guys understand. Well, I think we could tell by the muscle bound shirt and the tattoos. Yeah, <laughs> I wear the stripes to accentuate that. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. You're ripped. I get it. <laughs> but yeah, I went to law school straight out of college and and quickly realized it was a mistake. But I did do two years. Now, I don't know if you know this, but Lisa also went to school. She was a biology major and was thinking of continuing education, continuing her education, and maybe even in medical school or so, or something, yeah, get, certainly first, getting her master's, right? Right, the first goal was medical school. I dropped that and I just wanted to study evolutionary biology forever. So corporate law, evolution. Until I evolved out of it, yeah. <laughs> I love it, I love it. Classic fallback, evolution. <laughs> <laughs> of course, and but both of you at one point obviously said, I have, is it I have to give this a try or I want to give this a try? Because there's a lot of kids who were right now in school thinking of like, oh, should I even try this? What was, and I'll let Lisa go first just because bigger name and she's ladies first. That's right. Um, <laughs> the ladies first. That's right. <laughs> um, and like turn our video off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, uh, I did feel like I had to, mm -hmm. I wanted to, but I mostly felt like I had to because uh, it felt like this is the time to go for this at, right after I graduated. It, 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 because um, like you're 22, you don't have any responsibilities. You won't be burdening anybody with this. Right. Suit, and um, this is the time to do it because you need to know so you don't have regrets when later on if you had never tried. That's incredible. And I know your parents were super supportive after sending you to Vassar, right? They were so supportive because uh, for my mother, she was afraid that I was such a depressive that I would never find a husband and get married. So it would be great <laughs> if I could lighten up. Oh, interesting. Is that, is that true? Is that, is yeah. That, wow. And my dad too. He was like, yeah, great, great. Like they all wanted me to just like lighten up. Lisa, were you were you a class clown type in high school? No, were you? I I, I he's from I was Rock, and wasn't probably. like in classes I felt comfortable I was and other classes I was really shy probably. Oh God, no, 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 not me. <laughs> no. How about you, Dimitri? At the, on the Jersey Shore, Tom's River High School, if I'm not mistaken. Tom's River High School North. Oh, sorry. Um, I was, I was, um, I, I had a unique, not, not really a unique experience, but I was student council president. I was well-rounded with my activities, uh, you know, getting good grades doing, I thought I was sort of winning at the whole thing. I was like, I'm doing, you know, this is great. Um, not popular though. And I think I liked puzzles and palindromes, which has never really aged into what I thought it would be like, no, <laughs> <laughs> go-to conversation stopper is just the word palindrome when you get to the m sound in palindrome it's like right it's party killer like yeah. anti-aphrodisiac it's kind of incredible <laughs> so but i was like yeah i was like on my own weird trip didn't really fit with my family um loved comedy as i discovered it just through television mm -hmm. felt it was never crossed my mind that that was a possibility um or would have access to that world or showbiz in any way and had no sort of links to it, maybe like you guys too. Um, 
But to bring the room up, my dad died when I was in college. And I right. think it was after he died that I had a similar thought that Lisa had for a different reason, but it was more based in avoiding regret mixed with a very sort of dark, um, typical response probably, which is, well, life is short and I can't even get my father's approval or disapproval at this point. <laughs> Who am right. I doing this for? Um, I don't want to regret, especially he died when he was 46. And I was like, this could be a sh much shorter ride than I expected. So I'm going to try this now right have what could be my midlife crisis when i'm 24 um and see what happens and so that that is very clearly what i remember being sort of my launch pad into it wow do you miss that corporate law future uh, that you killed so that you murdered you know all the stories and the, the just the, <laughs> the romance of corporate law yeah, <laughs> of course romance. of course uh, no I always say that my worst day in comedy was better than my best day in law school, which I do still think is true. And I've definitely, can we curse? How does this work? Yeah, you can curse, but. Okay, I've eaten a, certainly a lot of shit along the way. And it's, um, but none of that felt worse. Not that law school was like a constant pain or something. I just. Right. It was that moment. How many people from Tom's River went to Yale? Excuse me, Tom's River North. I don't know, not not to. I think I was the first from, but then another guy my year got in, and then people oh, okay. were like, Jonathan's like, that's bullshit, man. You're the one. I was like, it doesn't. I don't think it works that way. He can go there too. I don't care. You right. know, I was psyched. It was my long shot for sure. It was, that was like a big deal for me. I've, Did, I'm always grateful that I got to go there because it sort of pulled me out of where I was from. Right, right. Did any of you ever think of going either to USC or UCLA or one of these like show businessy kind of LA schools? No, no, no. I wanted a small liberal arts residential college. Mm -hmm. I wanted that experience. Not, a, I felt I'd be overwhelmed if there were too many other people. Right. And that's in Poughkeepsie. Is that where that is? Yeah, Poughkeepsie. And did, when you left there, did you feel like, oh, I got everything I needed out of this? Because again, kids are watching this, right? Or young adults yeah. are watching this right now. And like, how do I maximize this college experience? Is, was there any advice you can give or? For, not based on my experience. I didn't do one play. I stayed right. the furthest away from the theater department or nice. the film students. Yeah, no, I had, I was biology all the way. It wasn't until that summer when I graduated that I started he, not hearing voices, but <laughs> yeah, you know, just having thoughts that were completely irrational for what my goals were right like right. i'd hear a commercial on the radio for a, a sitcom and i'd hear their you know they're promoting their big joke line and i'm driving around i'm listening i'm like ugh, you're hitting that joke too hard lisa <laughs> remember to try to throw it away and then <laughs> and then then i'd think when like that was, <laughs> what all the time or see someone on david letterman and they looked kind of phony and i'd think ugh. Please, just remember not to be that phony when, when you're you on do David Letterman. Letterman. And I was like, why would I be on David Letterman for <laughs> like the discovery and evolution? What? It would, I'd have these weird thoughts and then I just find- so I do feel I like, it, can I follow up on that a little bit? Because yeah. I feel like you have a heightened sense of comedy because even at that point, when you're not in it, you're not doing plays, your focus, as you said, you still knew like, oh, the way to get a laugh is not going to be this crazy over the top thing. It's going to be a subtle, grounded character. Like, where do you yeah, think that I, even came from? Like, I know people are laughing because I can hear the laugh track. I know people think that's funny, but when I do it, I'd rather not. Oh. You know? And then I play the most broad character on a sitcom. Right. Of the six of us. But, you know, what can you do? What do you think about that, Matt? <laughs> well, what in particular? Okay, never mind. I thought you <laughs> might add. No, just that somebody who was like completely focused on biology. And well, I was when she was saying that, I was thinking what she was saying earlier about when she taught someone in class and, uh, you know, someone who thought they couldn't be funny could be funny. I, I st that is true. Maybe you can take the 
subjectively least funniest person in class and teach them a skill and show them, see, you, you did the thing and you, you can do it. But the reverse of that is there's always one person in class like Lisa uh, <laughs> or, or I had in one of my class, I had Neil Flynn was in my, was in my class before yeah. he was on my group. And I felt embarrassed teaching him because I was like, this guy gets it. I was, I felt weird giving him notes. He so intrinsically got it more than everybody else in the class. And I believe Including everyone yourself. else in the class, well, I was teaching it, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I was teaching that class, but I, 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 I felt that everyone else was learning and getting better, but I could tell Neil Flynn had that special something, you know, that he had before he ever took a class. And I think Lisa and Dimitri probably do too. But Matt, there's one thing. I wasn't teaching that person. I was a fellow student in the class. Right. So meet me now. Hi, I've got notes for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. But those are supportive in both places. I'm assuming it's gra grounded, but it's, it's built on sort of a sub it's supportive in its DNA, right? What? In improvisation? No, in those where you got where you were in class and of course where Matt was teaching. Those aren't, those don't tend to be too snarky. Like people welcome the notes, I assume, if you're doing it right. Yeah, yeah. Well, he was asking me, but no, the it's once you're in the company, everyone got snarky. It, but um, in the classes, for the most part, the teachers were pretty nurturing, you know, and supportive and trying to make it a safe place for people to go out on a limb, right? I, I, I okay. um, Ian Roberts, my, my partner, he, he believes even more strongly than I do that, especially when it comes to the straight man, which is such a huge part of comedy, that that is a skill that you can teach someone that might not be necessarily like a funny person who could write funny stuff, but they could be an excellent straight man. So uh, that's a big role playing part of comedy that I think you can teach uh, to a lot of people. I, I and even in an improv group, there's always those people who have that skill who it's like, I'm glad they're in the group because they're making it better because using listening, grounding, that kind of thing and teamwork to make it better. And not is that all? Are those themselves. all chapters of your book? Probably, yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. That was that the first plug. couple of years writing just on teamwork. I found Sorry. with stand-up, it's like you're, you're in success, especially you're... Um, you're kind of like a traveling salesperson if, if it goes well enough. Right. So you're out there alone, right? And Wayne, you know this from, and, and I don't know if, I'm assuming you, uh, Lisa and Matt, you both have, I know Matt, you've done stand up. I've been on shows with you way back in New York. We did some, um, but Lisa, have you ever done stand up or just monologues? Uh, just character monologues in front of audiences, in classes. One of the exercises was stand up and just do five minutes of stand up, like uh -huh. improvised. Oh, cool! That How was that just to demonstrate to us that if you're comfortable, they'll laugh. If you up there are not comfortable, no one's going to laugh because they're too uncomfortable for you. <laughs> so that was a fantastic exercise. So it yeah. sounds like you got a lot out of the script. And if I'm not mistaken, well, that wasn't groundlings. That was an, uh, oh, an acting class. Oh, that was an acting class. Interesting. Yeah. Well, Wayne, now would I, you, go ahead, Dimitri. When you, what I found from over the years of touring, and of course I'm still learning, but when you, once you're kind of out there, it was just interesting before you decide you're going to try to do comedy as a job, or I guess even to try it. There's, there's never, when people, I always, think when people say that's funny um if they're not trying to do comedy sort of officially when they say that's funny they don't realize that it's not a the whole sentence is that's funny to me right they just like to me is like it's removed and it's just as an absolute or something but then i found when i started doing comedy the end of the sentence was super important that's funny to who to a college audience, to a nursing home audience, to my family at Thanksgiving, to other comics at the shitty open mic. It, I mean, that became such a big part of it. And then wherever you're developing, it's a massive and very influential feedback loop that I think determines what how you see what's funny and how you are funny or not. That was pretty serious. That's a really good point. 
I think. It was, it's been my experience and it's, I'm, I definitely overthink things. And I think a lot of people do who maybe try to do creative. as a, as a standup, it's very satisfying to hear those exact words. You'll hear it sometimes within the laughter you'll hear. It's usually a drunk person going, that's really funny where they just, <laughs> <laughs> they literally just say, that's it. It's you're like, all right, thanks. I'll take that. Yeah, totally. I had a bit that never worked that I still like. And it was, uh, you know, I've been doing comedy a while. And I, I, as soon as I think I start to know what's funny, you know, I'm always surprised. And an audience will teach me a new audience at a late show or whatever, you know, I thought I was getting, but then they sort of correct me. I said, my friend, though, he's lucky. He doesn't do comedy, but he knows because sometimes he'll just say, now that's funny. And I'm like, oh, wow, that must be awesome to just know. (laughs) (laughs) Of course, of course, of course. And now, Lisa, is it true the first time you tried to get into Groundlings, they were like, you have to take a class even to audition for Groundlings? Yeah, you had to take a class with a teacher named Cynthia Segetti, who was so great. So Uh, that rejection turned out to be a great thing for you. Well, yes, but here's why, if you want to hear this story. (laughs) Um, um, Because I went to the first class and I was mortified because it was so embarrassing to me. Everyone had to like lift a disc. And there were a lot of actors in there who, you know, were doing great because they were getting commercials and they were very, you know, now I'm doing comedy, you know, like just, ooh, it, it, I was cringing and like lift a disc, you know, and she'd throw out emotional adjustments, angry, grrr, making like this whole meal out of it. And I went home and thought, I don't know, this isn't for me. I'm not one of these people. So if that's what it takes, because they all seem to be very successful. Right. I, I, don't, I don't know that I can do this. So I made myself go next week, I was late. They were already up throwing space balls. And I was like, <laughs> I don't, don't want to, you know, disrupt what's going on. I'm going to sit here and, and, and just politely watch. And there was one person there who was not making a meal out of it. He was genuinely, it looked like he was just <laughs> like throwing a space ball. Like he was throwing, it looked like he was throwing a ball, not a space ball. I don't know what that would look like. He was throwing a ball. <laughs> you know, he wasn't making a meal out of it. He was just doing it. And she was like, great, that's commitment. And I went, that's commitment. <laughs> oh, I could do that. I get mm-hmm. that. That's not embarrassing. I made a beeline for that guy. Hot. I'm Lisa. How are you? You know, we started talking. Hi, I'm Conan O'Brien. And he is the reason I didn't quit. Because wow. he was so good. I went, okay, that's, I'm going to stick with him. And we became best friends. He makes amazing space balls even to this day. <laughs> you have to look if you ever do his podcast or you have to ask to see some of his space work. Yeah. You can't appreciate space balls on his podcast. Because his now, one thing, but space balls, lifting discs. He was like, he was six five or whatever he is, and probably like quite the skinny guy at that. I mean, he's still skinny, but he must have been already an interesting sight anyway. Easy to see. With the red hair, yeah, like yeah, no, you. But he was good. I, I had a similar experience, Lisa, when I started improv in Chicago, that lasted for months, and I just stuck it out. It's because I'd paid for the classes, but. There was a, when you say space balls, that makes me, I was telling my wife about (laughs) walking through lava today. Like I felt like I walked through lava for, for six months where we would start these classes. And there was this one teacher in particular who was a legend, but for an hour, we, he would just go, okay, you're walking through lava. You're walking through lava. How does that feel? Now you're in a shower. How's that feel in your face? And I'd look around and go, oh my God. Everyone else seems way into this. I'm not, I got to get out of here. <laughs> and especially I was coming from the stand-up world, which is so cynical. Oh, so you're like, yeah. going, oh boy, what is happening here? Yeah, it was all too earnest for me. So um, yeah, I stuck with the guy who wasn't. <laughs> so see, Dimitri, you missed all of that by not going to class. Totally. I don't know. I just, I, I for me, it was... It's yeah, it's weird. I mean, it's it's a cliche to say, but stand up, you're you're just kind of it's it's so solitary in a way. Um, I mean, it's so self-involved, which is I think very distasteful for a lot of people. 
but I think as part of the journey is not necessarily self-involvement, but you're just trying to, I guess all comedy would be that way where you're trying to figure out uh, when you're funny, you know, how did that work? Again, not like at a party when you're just hanging out. For me, it, it immediately, this whole like self-examination thing happened of like, how did the, like, how, how's that joke gonna work? How's that joke working? Like, right. So it's almost like math for you, it sounds like. Maybe like at least in, a, in the beginning. And then I loosened up a bit and started to be more of a person and kind of came back to myself. I think. Right. But, yeah. I, 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 I saw that happen with Dimitri, too, if I may. But hey, let me hear. And if I if I can make an analogy here, because we haven't really drawn the difference between improv and sketch and then stand up. And I think there's a big difference there. Because in improv and sketch, you're working with other people and you have a group mind and I can't read other people's minds. So I have to have a, a certain set of skills to let me know how to deal with other people. But in stand up, it's just my head. All I got to know is how my brain works. <laughs> and then I go on stage and what I say is either funny or it's not. It's that simple in stand up. And then you go back to the drawing board and that part that wasn't funny, you change. And so my analogy is the art form of fine art. So you got, there's always that one kid in class who can just draw. Like everybody wants to draw, but you look at one kid, you're like, that guy can just draw. He hasn't been <laughs> taught. He can just draw. But it's, it's with a pencil, right? Yeah. So he can, with a pencil, draw something. And if you let him with a pencil grow up to be 40 and he did nothing but just look at things and draw, he could get better and better at drawing without ever having anyone teach him anything, I believe. But if he were to watercolor or use oils, I'm going to more extreme glass blowing or sculpture. Mm -hmm. He can't do that by himself. She can't do that by himself. They're going to need some kind of teaching to, to show them how watercolors work and how to mix and how to do all that kind of stuff. They're going to need the, the glass blower. You need the tools. You need to know temperature. There's all this stuff you need to be taught, right? But stand up is something where you, I don't think you need to be taught as much. It is more just like fine drawing and you can just figure it out yourself. And it's so direct with the audience. Like as long as you're not totally deluded, I think, and you're paying attention, they really are maybe a brutal teacher often, but a very present, immediate teacher each time saying like, no, okay, yeah, okay. More of that. <laughs> of that. And, and I saw Dimitri start and do and mathematically, because he was just smart, he like he said, he started, he was with the palindromes, everything was very clever and wordplay. Like he said, he was about efficiency of words and this is back in like the mitch hedberg era of like yeah. people really appreciating fine short stephen wright-esque jokes and dimitri jumped right into that at a very he was successful at it very quickly and very early and it was obvious and it was because you're you're very smart so but then I saw you do that one man show you're talking about at UCB where you talked about your life and you brought your life into it. You added your cleverness to your life experience. And I think that's the next level that you were talking about uh, achieving as a performer at that point, not just being clever, but showing who you are too. No, that's when I quickly lost my way. It was definitely once I started to try to be a person. <laughs> <laughs> but can I ask a question about stand up? Because sure. that's like the crafting of a joke. You have to write it. And how do you know when, if it doesn't get a good response, it's you just have to sort of rework the delivery or, and not throw the whole thing away. It's cool. I mean, I don't know for me, what I always like about stand up is like, there's, I just find no certainty whatsoever. And it's just so humbling in a great way that it's like, okay, cool. It's, I mean, it, if we're talking science, the little I know about it, it would be, I could make guesses or there's probabilities over repeated trials. And I could say like, cool, I did that joke 300 times. Like it, it you know, it's an 80% whatever joke and accounting for this or that, I followed somebody dirty. There was a heckler, this bachelor party got out of control. I had diarrhea, whatever the fucking, you know, it's just like it, it, all things being equal. Okay, cool. That one. So when it comes time to say shoot a special or do a late night TV spot or something, I could I, I never have any guarantees, but I, I would find over time in repeated trials. And then eventually it did, I found improv in my own way where it was like a one person in a very supportive audience in that sort of room. The fun of it became trying to write jokes just on stage until your, your written voice matches your real voice 
Yeah. And it's more seamless, you know? I don't know. But there's also this, like, uh, to me, a very nuanced acting that happens with stand-ups that I'm not sure they get credit for because it seems like then you go on a run or like some segue that seems like, oh, this just occurred to me, but it didn't because it was written. And it's just really great acting. Those are some of my favorites for sure. I think it's an interesting revelation when you've seen stand up. For all of us growing up, of course, there was no internet and the you could not study the way people can now. I remember watching HBO specials and half hour comedy hour young comedian specials. I was like, just looking for those stand up spotlight on VH1 and get little tidbits of stand up, but there was no, I couldn't go see like all of George Carlin's jokes ever and various performances of the same joke. Yeah. It's different. I'm sure it's way different now, but yeah. Lisa, don't you think a skill that, that, you use on a sitcom like when you get the script from the writers and you see some jokes you're like i know if i reworded this joke that i know what they want the joke to be but i bet if i flip the sentence around and did a little yeah. bit differently yeah and you'll you'll give them their take on that first run but then you'll go hey how about if i yeah, yeah. and then you pitch your version i yeah. think it's that same part of the brain with the stand-up of like you just start to hit develop that muscle of like with your own stuff of like oh i know the the funnies in there i just didn't say it right or i didn't start it right or i didn't get them on it's usually not getting on them on board right away like <clears throat> i didn't explain to them i didn't i didn't take them in first before i went to my uh clever part lisa were you able to, as in as your sitcom sort of success took off was there more improvisation that was allowed or encouraged once you guys sort of had it or was it sort of more of a collaborative like cool we're in the pocket like through through rehearsals this we got we kind of got it like a play and it was like okay let's let it ride um well they were yeah they were pretty collaborative from the very beginning um and you were always allowed to pitch something and um you know but they had their eye on a you know <laughs> on, on a bigger thing and and um, but no, you basically, the writing was pretty good, you know, for, for that. It was, we weren't really, and on show night, you did not improvise. You just didn't because our shows took six shots hours. To shoot. I don't know a lot of you. Did you get two shots at each joke? Basically like two oh. audiences on show night? No, we did many, many takes and there were many, many rewrites because they always want to try to see if they can come up with something better. And our, you know, like to, to shoot a half hour show, it usually takes like two hours, right, Barnett, David? And um, <laughs> our show took six to eight hours. We had to switch out audiences. Hmm. I have a question about that. Like when you, let's say you did it and they wanted to do that joke again, but not rewrite it. How much of a fall off from the audience when the element of surprise is taken out of that punchline can you feel? Um, yeah, you could definitely feel it. Definitely. Uh, even though the warm up guy was instructing them to laugh. So they sound, they were pretty good actors too. They matched, you know, how they laughed the first time if they had the will, you know, but after you see something five or six times, you know, right? It's just not funny. And they're cold because it's freezing. And uh, yeah, so I, I, I kind of disregarded the audience. Anyway. What do you mean by that? I mean, I didn't really let the audience sitting in front of me let me know if the audience at home, when they see it on camera, is going to laugh. Wow. And where did you have the confidence for that? Where did you, was that just an instinctual thing? Yeah, because, well, no, because I had early on, uh, the first sitcom I ever went to see taped was Cheers. Okay. Oh, that's awesome. And I know. And the thing I realized was they were so subtle. They were throwing things away. I couldn't even fully hear everything. And I kind of didn't know what was going on. They were performing for the camera 
not for me sitting in the audience. And you had monitors and stuff, but the sound was just a little different. I don't know. Um, so I just, that's when I realized, oh, they're not performing for the person in the back of the house. They're performing for me when I'm at home, you know, and getting to see it. Wow. It's like a reciprocal of that, as I read, like not too long ago about Chaplin, which maybe everybody knows, but when he, when a lot of the stuff he was shooting over on, is it San Vicente? No, uh, La, La Siena. La Brea. La Brea. La Brea. I haven't left my house in a year. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. But when he was shooting stuff, because they were silent films, they would encourage people to come in to have a live audience. So he was doing bits and getting feedback on a lot of the bits and saying, cool, that's taking notes, saying that worked really well with this crowd. Interesting. Matt, you worked with Chaplin, right? What was it like? What was he like? You're really his... aging me. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> towards the end of his career, we did a few when he got into talkies. Yeah, yeah. And that. didn't do as well. Right. Didn't you middle for him on the road? You know, I was just reading about Gre in, his, in Groucho Marx's book, Groucho and Me, mm -hmm. the first time Groucho met Charlie Chaplin. But they they treated uh, vaudeville like such a job back then, um, like the Marx Brothers mom got them in just like you guys could go make money doing this. Right. <laughs> That's how they got into showbiz. And so a lot of these guys were doing and everything was rote, like people, everyone was doing the same shtick, like being original wasn't really the thing. And when Groucho saw Chaplin, he was like, told his brothers, you got to see this guy, this guy. This is before he was famous. Th this guy gets it. And then the story tells us going backstage and talking to him and then Chaplin going, I just got offered uh, $500 a week to do these films they call them or whatever and at that point films were looked down on like ah theater's where it's at <laughs> i don't even know what point i'm trying to make but uh an interesting question from Corey eubanks do you mind no do it let's do can it a, can a teacher's own biases about what they find funny get in the way of teaching coaching comedy and i say absolutely yes and, you know, if if their sense of humor isn't matching what your voice is or, you know, what you're working on, you just got to take that into account. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You have if you have to do comedy. To learn comedy also. It looked like you were getting choked up. It was because I, uh, I took a Nicorette and <laughs> very irritating, I like, but I need it. Feels this shit like this is real. <laughs> Don't let it get you. <laughs> don't let that teach Damn it. Not fair. Those teachers who, no, just don't. <laughs> but I did experience that a lot. Like, you know, I was at the groundlings, but my sense of humor wasn't very groundlings. And, Tell me what that means. What does that mean? Well, to me, it wasn't funny to blacken a tooth and wear a fright wig. Right. That wasn't funny. And, but they still let me in. I liked doing, you know, these sort of, um, character behavioral a little more subtle believe it or not sort of like character driven like monologues and mm -hmm. and and sketches and they were not crowd pleasers for a groundlings audience okay so you're not getting the reaction from that groundlings crowd was there a teacher back to our original topic that was like yeah hey i get and what you're doing keep doing that there were those teachers and then there were teachers that didn't get what I was doing and would be like, she's just got to have more energy. I don't, let's re she should repeat this level. So I did, I had to repeat levels, um, you know, cause I wasn't like loud enough, broad enough, big Wait enough. Wait a minute, you got held back at Groundlings? Yeah, yeah. Matt, how does that all work? Do you, do you judge the kids? Do they go to different levels? I never went to any of these yeah. schools. So tell me how it works on the other end of that. Well, I'll, I'll tell you why you get judged and yeah. why because at a certain, as you move up in levels, you want the people around you to be as serious in the same skill level as you. And I remember when I was in classes and I felt like there was some Chicago schools where just you could go all the way through no matter what was going on with your skill level. 
And I felt very frustrated in my later levels because I felt like I was wasting my time half the class. So, uh, and that's how most schools work, you know? So uh, I'm all for that. I, now, uh, judging someone's sense of humor, that's a whole other thing. And I think that's more what the question was about, not their skill level, right? right. So uh, that, that, that's for sure true. And, but, but I would, as a teacher or as someone judging someone, try not to judge their funniness or what I thought was funny about them. I don't think that's what you're there to do as a teacher. It's like, are they hearing the, the lessons being taught? Are they understanding them? I think that's what the teacher is supposed to do, not to mm-hmm. go, that's funny and that's not funny. That's not really a teacher thing. That's more like a director of a sketch show thing. Or, or... Right. And I think the ultimate goal is anyway to find your voice, you know, oh. or as they'd say, and I hated it sometimes, uh, find your clown. <laughs> but um, but I think it's <laughs> creepy. It sounds like it's in your house. <laughs> you need to get that clown and get it out. Yeah. There were some teachers who'd say that. That was tough for me to hear. It's like, all right, that's not what they mean. Just translate it. <laughs> Use your translator in your head. Right. Comedic voice, tone, all that. Um, that's that to me. That's what the the goal is. You know, for anyone in a class, um, you're just experimenting with just different styles, kinds, and improv. What's so great about it is that you get involved in a scene. You're taken away into a whole other tone and level or place or character that you don't think is your thing and then you discover you're able to make it funny and now you've got something else i also think you don't have to be good at every single like right you you can be just there's some people who are just they just do their thing or they're quirky in a way or they're they just and it's great. Like they just, they just do their thing and they, they can't do other characters. They only can do one character or they only can do the voice of reason or, but whatever, you need all sorts of different flavors on a group and ex- life experience. And so we shouldn't be judging people's sense of humor. We should be judging how they work together more mm-hmm. and are listening to each other and using those skills. And committing to what they're doing. If you commit enough, Back. it's going to be, funny it'll be interesting it'll either way it's going to be interesting if there's a real commitment i think right right? can i loop back to something that was said earlier about being comfortable on stage how important do you think that is in comedy and anyone can jump in on that and can you learn that i think you can i think i agree with what lisa said and i often just think that um People just can't be worried for you. I, I mean, I when Lisa was saying that, I remember saying the same thing to friends pretty early on in the thing of just like, oh, right. Even if they're on your side, as soon as they're worried, it's the whole thing crumbles. That house of cards is, is down. It's over. But I think you can learn it. To, to be comfortable on stage? Matt, how would you teach that? Well... It's also like there's different stakes, Wayne. You know that. Like, I, yeah. like I could, I can, I think I can be comfortable in any 100 to 300 person venue, right? Anywhere, but like there's, there's, we've done festivals where it gets up to 3,000 people. That that intimidates me, and I I've walked out into that, and uh, that's intimidating. And I get stage fright, but I can get over it but there's different levels to the person who's getting up on stage in front of five people. The first time that's 5,000 to me and right. 50,000 to Kanye West. Do you have whatever. Any, right. Do you have any techniques that you would could share for getting over that stage fright other than powering through? D- don't fo- I always try to see the people I can see in the, in the front and just focus on them and try to forget that it's it. Cause it usually is stakes. If it's, it's no longer, it used to be when I was younger, it was stakes of, is there a casting director here? Or is our group going to be on Comedy Central? That, that's kind of no longer in my head. Right. So now it's just like, am I pleasing the audience? Oh. And numbers do affect me after a certain point. I'm like, wow, there are a lot of people out there. That does get to me sometimes. 
Elisa, what about when you were auditioning? Did you have to deal with any of that? And what were your strategies that you might be able to share with some of our students? Yes. And by yeah. students, I mean me, who still auditions. No, I know. I could tell. Yeah. Yeah. But <laughs> I, I think um, I had a really phenomenal acting teacher. It wasn't even really an acting class. His whole, it was all cold reading. And his whole premise, no more than 10 of us there, was, I assume you can act. I'm not here to teach you how to act. I'm here to teach you how to cope with this business. So auditions, when you're a guest star on something and they're all tired of doing this damn show and they're cranky and you know, this is, I'm here to teach you how to focus and commit to what you're there to do and not think about anything else. Just show up, do your job and that's gonna be the best thing you could possibly do. And it's the same thing with comedy. You know, you, and auditions, yeah, Friends was an a, a insane number of, of auditions. And I really feel like I got it because I was the only person who could cope with the process. <laughs> oh, with the increasing, as, as Matt would say, the increasing stakes of each yes. round. I made it a, a, um, sort of a rule for myself. I don't want to know what Les Moonves looks like, who was running Warner Brothers. I don't need to know where L Warren Littlefield is sitting when I'm at the network audition. I don't need to see any of them. My job, this guy gave us permission, it's not to charm them with your dazzling conversation. You are there for three minutes is all they're asking that you are a character in a scene. They are dying for you to be good. They are dying for you to be good because they can relax. And, um, they're on your side. If they're eating, it's because they're hungry, not because they want to upset you, you know? Um, I like that note that Lisa said that they're dying for you to be good. It's, that's something someone told me at some point. Like, I was like, oh, yeah, they, 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 they want someone to fulfill the role and do a really good job. So yeah, they, yeah. They, uh, they're not against me and judging me. Or they are judging me, but they're, they really do want it to happen. People yeah, and to a show, they want to laugh. I mean, it's really not that different. They want to laugh. Different, but yeah. Give them permission. Be okay with whatever happens, you know? That's amazing. Uh, and who was that teacher? I feel like you've gleaned a lot from great teachers through Yeah, your... yeah. No, his name is Ian Tucker. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I remember actors, you know, at Warner Brothers, they had it in a theater, like a 200-person theater, you know, and they were right. 20 executives or something. I don't know, because I wasn't paying attention. Um, but people, actors that worked a lot, and I would think, oh, you are such, you're perfect for Phoebe. You are perfect for this character. I'm not, you know, but you are. And these, they'd come out of the, out of the theater going, fuck, are they fucking kidding? How are you supposed to have a good audition? There's like 20 people in there judging you. And I thought, you know, there's like 200 people in an audience when you shoot the show. What are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> what? You can't care. It's their, that's their problem to decide whether you're good or not. You're just showing them, here's what I would feel great about doing if I had to do it for five years. Here's my take on it. And I really had that attitude for no reason at all. But Except I, that teacher, that teacher, I feel like helped you, right? Right. But it's not like I was, you know, I actually, and, you know, Barnett um, probably knows, but I was a recurring character on Mad About You. And right. I just wanted to secure that job. I wanted to make sure I could always be on Mad About You. And I knew that I was offered a, a pilot on another network, but I wanted to get the Friends pilot because that was on the same network. And I figured that way I'll be able to still do Mad About You after this pilot. Maybe we'll get to do six episodes and then it'll go away. But yeah. All right. <laughs> Dem really interesting. Dimitri, is there any questions you're seeing in the chat that interest you at all? Oh, yeah. I saw a couple. Yeah. Let's go ahead. Because this is a sh we're doing a shared experience here. Great. Um, I should have, I should have been more prepared. I, I don't know what the, the sort of etiquette is of how you're reading and listening and all that stuff. So that's yeah. fine. But I saw something about like, what was my takeaway working for Conan, which yeah. I thought was a good and relevant question. As Lisa mentioned her experience knowing Conan so well for so long. Yeah. 
Um, I'm going to, yeah, what was, what was your main takeaway from writing on late night? And Lisa, same question for you. It says, but for the comeback and web therapy. Um, my takeaway was I was thrilled to get to work at Conan. I tried a few times, to, twice to get that job. And I think I got it on my third try. So at that time in New York, like that was one of the writing jobs. Um, when Conan was at NBC, everybody would apply when a job, nobody left those jobs, especially the sketch writing job, which was you were writing everything but the monologue. Um, so you had to, you had to do a packet that was 12 yeah. sketches, like in paragraph form where you just sort of describe the sketch. And anyway, the first time I submitted, they were like, the head writer contacted me and said, Hey, you know, you were close, but we, we went with someone else, but you should submit again, you know? And at that point, of course, I'm doing open mics and everything. So this is an absolute dream if I could get it. So long story short, when I eventually did get to work at Conan, it was fantastic. I, I loved working for Conan and for Jeff Ross, his producer. Mm -hmm. Mike Sweeney was the head writer at the time. It was such a great, supportive, creative environment. to. Be. Did it help your stand up at all? I don't know if it did. Um, I ended up leaving because of the time commitment. And then I decided I'm going to give stand up a go. What I right. always tell people who ask me is I found something interesting, which is when you go for these sort of crazy jobs and showbiz careers that are statistically just so hard to, to make happen often, I have found that if you really have a dream, this weird thing happens where the closer you get to it, the more attractive the exits become. Oh. Where you're like, you know what I mean? Where you're like, wow, this is so great. This isn't really what I was going for, but this is great. And that could be perfectly fine, but I just kind of knew that I had to risk going way back to get maybe more closer to the thing right. I really wanted. Is that because your dad was dead? Yes. Well, that's, I mean, yeah. I haven't mentioned the ghost part of him being a big oh, okay. part of him. <laughs> uh, as a manager. No, but, but yeah, I mean, I think, I don't know how much it helped my stand up, but, but I, I will say one of the, real treats of working for Conan was when we get to rehearsal, if you wrote a sketch, a character or a bit, or you got to direct your little piece, we played at rehearsal. And often that would be the first time Conan saw it. Uh -huh. And then he would give his notes and they would decide if it made it to the show for that night or whatever. His notes were always great. I, I don't remember Conan ever saying something and me thinking, yeah, right. The hell does this guy know? It was always like, oh, how did I not see that? So I really did right. feel like I was learning. I could feel tangibly learning, like, oh yeah, this that that makes a lot of sense. I'm learning. And he did a lot of space ball routines. <laughs> we were the space balls ourselves. I mean, I felt like a, a ball that he was manipulating, not in a sexual way, but in a completely oh. me too friendly, you know. What? <laughs> gotcha. Hey. <Same. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> No, but it, it was great. And I will say the same thing at The Daily Show, my brief time there. I'd get notes from Jon Stewart and it would be like, how did I not see that? That's like, mm -hmm. you know, t personal style and taste aside. I'm just talking about like editing, moving the joke. Right. The joke. It was often like, well, if you're going to do that, if that's the joke, then how about, and I'd think, oh yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah. I mean, it's all about like, because like John Stewart and Conan O'Brien, they just give their full attention to that stuff. Not while they're doing it, it's before and after. And, and just giving it their full attention to just clock what works, what doesn't. And then, you know, it just gets sort of assimilated. And, you know, just and look, I mean, Conan was a uh, president of the Harvard Lampoon uniquely two years in a row. I, no one before that had ever done that two years right. in a row. It's a lot of work. So, I mean, he was writing good comedy, we assume, you know, in college and just kept doing it every day. So okay, I'm going to ask you a question from somebody named Andrew Aidman. I think I'm getting this right. If not, could be fired next semester. Why do you think there is so much funny and suffering, which actually... Lisa, that's not your case at all. You're you don't seem like a suffering kind of person to me, Matt. Of course you are philosophically speaking. And all right, let's just leave it at that. Let's leave it at that. Why do you think there's so much comedy that comes out of suffering? Or does it? Well, yes, 
Um, uh, it's, I mean, look, comedy is a great coping mechanism mm -hmm. for people too. Um, and, you know, the, we all suffer to degrees, you know, embarrassment could be called suffering if that's what you mean also. Right. Um, and choking on Nicorette. I mean, on it, which was a hilarious bit I did earlier. <laughs> and I think, <laughs> but it's all, it's identifiable. It's relatable. We all understand it immediately. There's a shorthand, you mm -hmm. know, to that stuff. I was going to say too, as you were saying that, Lisa, it made me think about empathy. And I know it's a, a matter of personal taste often, but in connecting with, with other people, whether it's live or through a screen or whatever, I don't know, em genuine empathy seems to be um, a real way to connect with other humans. And suffering just seems to kind of invoke empathy or it's certainly a shortcut to it. And the cliche, of course, is to have the, you need the foreground, the background in order for the foreground to pop. So yeah. if, the, if, the, if the background is darkness then, and you're trying to do something light, the contrast might be really helpful for, for the content to pop. Right, like look, Phoebe Buffay, like the pilot, her monologue is about how her mother killed herself, her stepdad went to jail and she was living in a car with a heroin addict or you know something like that. And that's not funny. But Phoebe's attitude about it was, you know, my mom killed herself, like as we've all experienced, you know, sort of like as they do, you know, <laughs> this outrageous, sort of, you know, here's something we all have in common. And, you know, it's horrifying. But her attitude about it is like, you know, not a big deal, but this happened, that and that and that. It's, like, it's not a big deal to this person. You know, and for the comeback for me, that stuff is the funniest thing when a person is completely unaware of how they're coming off or something's embarrassing and, you know, just doesn't see it at all. Like someone's trying to humiliate them and it's, they don't get it or they get it and say, well, I'll just turn it into lemonade and mm -hmm. they, they're not. Yeah. I find that stuff funny. I find, I guess I find suffering hilarious. But it's great because I think in that, like, if you want to call it character based comedy, when it feels true, you just kind of know it when it feels true for you, that it is saying something about the human condition without sounding like a total asshole here. But it's like, I don't know, the stuff I love seems to do that for me, even if it's a weird joke or something, it's still, I know it's a short way, there's a long way of saying it's funny because it's true, but there's just something more to it, I think, as a person, as someone who's lived a certain life. Yeah. And I just love being put in my place. You know, right. that cracks me up. Like just the other night, Jim Burrow said something about, you know, casting friends and it was the end of pilot season and, you know, everyone good was cast already. Right, right. Oh, <laughs> 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 so, yeah. I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay, Matt, I have a question because you straddle these two worlds. You are, do stand up and you also do sketch and improv has been just doing sketch and improv as it helped your stand up? Well, I, I did stand up first and I, I often wonder, and I've, especially in the beginning of this conversation made me think about it that yeah. cause I started doing stand up in the, late eighties, early nineties, which was right in that boom. Yep. So it seemed stand up seemed very accessible to the whole world at that point. It was like this thing everybody was doing. And I wonder if, if, if I had been a little older, a little younger, if it would have been more scary to me to jump into that. And I never would have, cause I didn't, I never thought about that as a kid and I, I never would have pursued it in college, I just did a stand-up contest and I did well in it. And then I was, and I got the bug. I was like, Oh, I just had a lot of people laugh at me. I want to do more of this, but it was never an intent. All right. So they, I, my question was, did it help you in any way to be able to do both of those disciplines? I get, yeah. So, but once I abandoned stand-up, I, I, uh, I, I didn't get 
I've only really recently gotten back into stand up when I think I was talking to you about this when I was yeah. interviewing you the other day. And I was I would I think I was saying to you that what I wanted to do now was to explore more of a Jonathan Winters, Robin Williams kind of thing, which mm-hmm. is not what I used to do when I did stand up. But that would be a purely improvised kind of. And I always I always felt scared to do that as a stand up. I wanted to have like Dimitri said, I wanted to have my prepared bit know that it worked and i'm following somebody who has a prepared bit that works you don't want to just go out there and hey and go for it but now i feel confident in those skills as an improviser that maybe i can do that and i have with my material when i was developing my last special my pot humor which was on one theme i started doing that more and going ah i feel at ease at this Mm -hmm. And it was right before the pandemic where I was like, you know what? I'm going to go out and I'm going to start doing it this way. And then right. the pandemic hit. But that that, that, that is how I'm going to start pursuing it. But I, I really hadn't up till this point. Can I also ask you a follow up question that's slightly related to it's just about teachers. And uh, obviously, Lisa had these two incredible teachers that really seemed to help her in an enormous way. You were directed by Del Close, who was one of the like the godfathers of improv and sketch, right? A sketch. What did you get from that guy? And what was that experience like? Was it intimidating? Was it? Well, I was telling you about the, the guy who made me walk through lava. That's that him? guy. No, that was another legend. <laughs> oh, who was that, that guy inspired a lot of people. Oh, I see. A lot of my friends like point to that guy and go. They, they, he was their Dell, you know, oh, interesting. so um, but he had a whole different attitude and he almost made me quit that guy because he was too touchy feely, as I put it. Then I got to Dell and he was the opposite. Like in th- that guy, everything was great. Whatever you did on stage, he supported it was great. And I was like, it isn't all great. I don't like this because he's saying oh, the other seat. guy, the lava yes, guy. The yes. lava guy. And then I took Dell's class. Yeah. And the first scene I did, he's like, that was awful. <laughs> and he told me why. <laughs> you uh, stuck a sandwich in his mouth and you nailed his hands to a cross. So how's he supposed to speak to you? You were obviously f- full, full with your own ego and thought you were so hilarious. You didn't need to listen to your friend on stage. I was like, well, he totally cut me to the core. He was totally right. I changed because of what he said. Mm-hmm. I started listening. No more sandwiches, right? You weren't doing that. No, completely stuck with me because it was so important. It, it embarrassed right. me. It humiliated me, but it made yeah. me change and it made sense. and It was logical. And he was brutal. He would say whatever is on his head. He would say exactly the truth in his head. He wouldn't try to make you feel good or coddle you in any way. But you got to take it. You, you took it for what it was. And you you were like, I'm not going in there to have a to feel good about myself and have someone tell me I'm hilarious. I want to learn from this guy. He's obviously a genius. The negative of Dell was he didn't have any like stair steps teaching process. He would completely <laughs> forget what he taught you the week before. So you'd go in there and you just he'd just be whatever he was thinking about. I read a science fiction book by William Gibson the other day, and I'd like to try that. You go, I can barely improvise. What are we talking about? <laughs> but uh, what? I, but to answer your question, what he did for me was he he didn't say what a lot of the teachers were saying was just everything's great. He was like, no, not everything's great. This is either there, there are ways to do this that will make you better if you do it these ways. Were you ner- Yeah, it sounds like were you nervous around him? Did he was he like this legend guy strolling in? Yes. Yes. But I liked that. I liked that. I wanted to I wanted him to like me, you know. Right. Interesting. <laughs> there are a couple of legends around, you know, and I took classes from all of them. They're all intimidating in their own ways. Right. And this was in Chicago, Illinois, where improv started, right? Chicago, Illinois. Man, I know it. Dimitri, this has nothing to do with you. This is all about <laughs> history of improv and sketch. Am I muted? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> all right, guys, we are almost done here. I'm going to take maybe Wowza. a couple, a couple yeah, more questions. questions. I feel like 
we're yeah. reflecting the, the, the well, these questions, you know, I I'm first of all, this has been I've learned so much as I hoped when they put this panel together that I would because it's inspiring and it's uh, informative. All right. That's enough with the compliments. OK. I like question 11, but I'm not sure. Should I read it? Stand up. Should I read it? Yeah. OK, this is from a oh, great. Achim Mendoza. I'm sure I, that's it. That's that's a fireable offense right there. Any tips for an international student slash foreigner who has done some comedy in his home country to break into the comedy industry here in the U.S., especially with how my sense of humor may be different? Sounds like a Dimitri question, right? Uh, yes. How did you figure out the numbers as the questions? I just want to read it and I can't. <laughs> I didn't see the question you wanted to answer before. Anyway, okay. that's about us. Go ahead. Um, just coming from a different country, how do you approach? How what's your what's the angle in maybe if if you're trying to reach an audience here? Is that do, am I uh, paraphrasing that right? Oh uh, yeah, he says um, break into comedy industry here in the U.S., especially with how my sense of humor may be different. Right. Uh, well, I, I definitely would consider myself a niche performer, and that's just simply you know, I know how big the crowds I play and what I've sold or haven't sold. So I feel like I could speak to that to some degree. And as much as over the years, I have found that, um, and it was a different time and I didn't have, I, the internet was not my way in, but I did, I do believe in a country as big as ours that you can find your audience. It might take longer than you want, but they're assuming you're not so off the grid. I, I don't. I don't know how to say the words correctly, but right. I, I, you, do you guys know what I'm saying? I feel like there are. It's it's surprising once you really get out there that you can find your people. Um, some people are broader. Their their style or whatever is going to just attract a bigger audience. It's an easier get. Others, I do include myself in the others. It's going to be a more specific crowd, but I have found that crowd, not in my own family. I, I still don't have fans in my own family. But once I went out of Tom's River, New Jersey, I did start finding people. And I have been around the world and found people, you know, again, not huge crowds, but I find my people. So I do think geography matters to some degree, but I think if there's an authenticity and a specificity that often comes from not being afraid to be those things, Right. You can be pleasantly surprised by the people who do respond. And, and then when they do respond, it's almost a, a, a stronger connection. And they're like, hey, that's my person. Matt, have you ever had like students who maybe weren't fluent with the language coming into UCB trying to take classes? How do you approach that? Well, I think of our um, the Del Close Marathon that we, we did for years mm -hmm. and how crazy international it was. Um, um, you know, pre-pandemic once again, but like the, there was this uh, group, uh, Yellow Man from Japan, that they were one of the first groups to come. And I'm pretty sure they didn't speak English, but um, they would do their act in Japanese. And it was also a very physical act, but they did it to an English speaking audience who didn't know Japanese and would do very well every time. And it wasn't and it wasn't a gratuitous, we're being very supportive doing well. It was, it was funny. I watched them and you didn't have to know Japanese to appreciate what was going on and understanding the relationships. It was kind of fascinating actually, but um, that really wasn't what you asked. Uh, I, I have maybe a different way of answering the question that maybe yeah. kind of what Dimitri was saying is that I feel like a great thing about comedy versus drama is comedy doesn't lie as much. Like if you're, if you're funny and you get on stage enough times, an audience is going to tell you. Like, forget what a director or a teacher. It doesn't matter what they say. Mm -hmm. They can all say you suck and you don't understand. You're not funny, but an audience isn't going to lie. Like you're either funny to them or you're not. Right. And standups really get that. And uh, so if you when he says how, how internationally, how do I get into it? My sense of humor being different. I don't want to say to that. It's just like, get on as many varied stages as you can. And like Dimitri says, I think if you get on enough stages, you're going to find that that stage where they do think you're funny 
And if you get on 30 stages and no one thinks you're funny, maybe this isn't your thing, to be honest. I but also if- want to say to what Matt said earlier, when we were talking about when we were getting to know each other. Yeah. Man, I wanted to be Stephen Wright. I mean, I've met Stephen Wright over the years and told him that like he was my guy. Like Stephen Wright, for whatever reason, spoke to me. Like when I saw him, it was a revelation. And in a way that I think a lot of people can relate who have been, are musicians or comedians or painters or whatever, there's a, there's a stage when you're starting that you don't even know how much you are emulating the person. And at the same time, a part of you wants to be like them, but you know you can't, you know what I mean? It's a very strange thing. But over time, those repeated trials that I think you're talking about, Matt, something interesting happens. You not only find your audience and there's luck involved in that, but you cannot escape yourself. If, you, if you're doing it enough, even mm-hmm. if you're trying to be this thing that you think you want to be, you can't. It's just, there's something that, that, you know, it just comes out and, you know, you might not like it, but that is what's going to come out. Yeah, the audience can tell when you're not being authentic. They can tell. They can sniff that out. A really good actor. Yeah. Okay. Here's, I guess, this might be the final question, but it's going to be close to a wrap up is all of you went to college outside of the state you were from. And so what, and none of you really studied comedy in college. I know, I think Matt, you did radio, some radio stuff in college, right? I actually took one course. Oh, it was like a, like a general comedy course is more like, it wasn't like a how to, it was more right. like a history kind of more. Thing. Like a, so, um, all right. So yeah, I, I was a DJ. I stand corrected on that, but Sorry. like was the college you went to your first choice and the B part of it is what did you get out of your college experience? Like what was that worth it to spend those four years for you? I'm trying to get people to drop out of USC. That's my new goal. <laughs> <laughs> to go to Wayne University. Is because, that- yes, I have a new thing. You'll see it's on it's right. It's on Fairfax. It's right next to that pizza place. But anyway, go ahead. We bought that uh, booth. That's great, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. You saw that. You saw this. Yeah, yeah. I'll start, Wayne, because I have a very definitive answer on this one. Yeah. Um, and it was, I, Lisa earlier said, I wanted to go to a liberal arts school. I did too, but my I think my mom made me want to. And I'm glad <laughs> she did. But right. like me getting into the best liberal arts school was like my mom's mission from the time I was probably 12. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I and don't think she was a pushy bitch or something like that. She was very supportive. And I eventually got into Amherst college, my number one choice, you know, and I'll never forget that day. My mom was so happy. And like, but sometimes I think back, and I'm like, I think I went to Amherst a little bit more for my mom than myself. But that that's okay because I made a lot of great friends there, and I'm really glad I didn't stick around in Arkansas, just because my mom wanted life experience for me. She wanted me to go somewhere where I didn't grow up. Basically, it didn't matter where it was, just not in the South. Um, so, th- th- and that was a good choice. I'm glad I did that, and I think that's right. a good choice for everybody. Why go to school in the same place where you grew up? We can get some kind of life experience. But I didn't go for comedy for sure. And I didn't even think that was a possibility at all. But uh, yeah, I went to my number one college. I had no intention of doing comedy. I did radio because of my love of music. And through doing that was like, hey, I'm kind of funny on the radio. And people right. telling me I'm funny. And hey, there's a stand up contest. And I did that. And hey, I did really well. And so there right. was no plan. And I think that the generate, I think it's kind of different now, don't you, Wayne? Right. Well, I do. That, that people I mean, do have more of a plan. Like, I got to get into it now. Well, if, and I mean, I'm going to go around to uh, Dimitri and Lisa. And uh, this is but the I think the thing is, if there was let's say there was a comedy program like we do here at USC at Amherst. Do you think you would have jumped into that? You probably would have. Yeah. Yeah. OK, Lisa, you can go. No, I would not have jumped into a comedy program. Right. Ever. Interesting. Ever. No. Same here. Was that the question? No, that was a follow up for him. Oh. The overall question was, was that your first choice? And what did you get out of your college education that maybe you're like, oh, I that you enjoyed or were you like, oh, that was a waste of four years or oh, God, that it was-, was not a waste of four years. I mean, even though I did a 
you know, took a huge, this is a right turn. From yeah. Right. Okay. You know, um, <laughs> it, and, and I loved it. I decided I was going to love Vassar. It, I didn't really have a first choice. I just wanted to go to an Eastern school, mm -hmm. you know, um, an East coast school and, uh, and Vassar, that was thrilling and fine. I didn't know anything about it. Huh? Are you from California? Yes. I'm from Tarzana. And at my school, you know, they went, where are you going? Vazar? What is it? <laughs> I'm not kidding. Someone asked, is that a trade school? Oh, I love it. Yeah, I'm taking carpentry. I'm excited. Go. Oh, anyway. And so I I would. I, I like when the anger comes out every once in a while, Lisa. It's interesting to see. It. Oh, fury. It's rage. Yeah. <laughs> it's actual rage. Because you're so, you know, bubbly. And then all of a sudden, oh, there's the there's a cauldron underneath all of that. I get it. it, it there's rage. And <laughs> I was I decided I was going to be so happy. Yeah. I had already decided that it's going to work. I don't care who my roommate is. Look, we have so much in common. And, you know, ooh, everyone I meet, I love them so much. And even though people were like, sometimes, oh, you're Jewish? Oh, I don't like Jews. I'm like, you don't? Well, you don't know me. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> have you met any? <laughs> yeah, there were three in my high school. I didn't like them. Right. Like, oh, come on. Well, and then, you know, okay. how Jewish <laughs> were they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was just like no nothing was going to interfere with what this experience was going to be. I was thrilled, period. And after when I changed my mind, I had nothing to do with biology. My groundlings characters were informed by the people I met. I never would have met people who were from like the family called Dow, mm -hmm. Capital, you know, like I, I would never have met like these kinds of people that just, I mean, every, from like the whole spectrum of, from everywhere in the world and rich people and, you know, people who weren't rich at all and couldn't afford to leave campus. And, you know, wow. it was just the best thing to live with these people and get to know them and what's their life like. And I think I like mine better, you know? <laughs> um, and I'm talking about the extraordinarily rich people. Right, right. Oh, did you, you think you had an advantage over the extraordinarily rich people? Yes. In yes. what way? In what way? Uh, my parents were very present. Um, you know, they, they, a lot of them, not all of them, a lot of them felt like, you know, I'm not really expected to do anything. I've never really oh, gotten any encouragement to do anything. I like created this thing once and showed my dad and he said this, well, I could buy this for five cents. It's not, you know, um, so it was just a different, not everybody, but you know, I could, mm -hmm. yeah. And I just felt like, oh, I'm so grateful that, you know, I, I, I have a different upbringing. I feel like my, up, my upbringing, you know, really makes me part of the world and makes me able to just, I don't know, it was like getting to be an observer, you know? It, it, it was really, I loved it. And I got great characters out of those people. But at the time, were you thinking this is gonna be a great character? Or no, absolutely, yeah. absolutely yeah. not, no. Wow. No, I was just taking them in. Fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. Dimitri, you're the last because you're from New Jersey. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, no, first of all, it's been, I've had such a great time. Thanks for, if, if we're close to wrapping up, thanks. For we are. Me. Yeah. And um, it's been nice to get to know everybody, including Matt, who I've known for a long time, but this would be probably our longest extended conversation. And Lisa, I've spoken to briefly before, obviously. Um, but yeah, I, I would, I'd echo what you were saying, Lisa. I got to, and Matt, I got to go to my first choice, which was genuinely a long shot. I was as surprised as my family was. So I didn't even realize how much of a ticket I was getting out of where I was from. I'm by no means from a, some disadvantage, like standard middle class, Jersey Shore, normal house, all that kind of stuff. My parents didn't beat me up. Nobody had substance things. Like I was loved and everything. 
Um, I don't mean to throw that away, but <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I was loved. You know, whatever. My parents loved me. But but when I went to college, I, I for the first time started to feel like I wasn't I was very marginalized where I grew up in in sort of my status as an uncoordinated person with this nose. I, I knew where I stood and I couldn't do team sports and I sucked at this and I was a dork and all those things. And I liked palindromes and I was on the math team and all that. I got to go to Yale and I felt the it got normal. I was just like, cool, I, those traits are not what I'm defined as. And it might've been really the first time I started to feel like I was funny or that was a normal thing that I was identified as, even though it was never still not a thing that I could be or do or something. It just was like, along, along with maybe the more important cultural education, folks from different countries, different cultures, everybody was Italian and Irish where I grew up. Um, there were very few people of color in my schools ever. And I didn't, you know, you say, as they say, you don't know what you don't know. I just didn't even know how ignorant I was of a lot of things. And I sure I still am. I'm a straight middle-class white guy. So there's that limitation, you know what I mean? That like, you only sort of understand more about the older you get, I think, if you're yeah. looking and listening. But yeah, I, I felt super lucky to be where I was. And at the same time, it had, I, I don't know what the, the translation to comedy was for me. Maybe the philosophy classes I took, if I could right. go back, I would have taken more of that because it was all about creating mm -hmm. arguments and sort of worldviews. And in, in hindsight, those were like comics, a lot of those philosophers. I was like, oh, is that your your take? That's your bit? Okay. Okay, I guess my final question, is, and I'm going to piggyback something that was said earlier that Lisa kind of alluded to, which was very simple, was, was I feel like her attitude was a big part of her, her whole life, from auditioning to going to Vassar to all of these things. How important do you think attitude is and i'll start with you matt in just navigating the world of rejection and you know show business i mean you were from little rock and now you're in show business my battery's dying so i'll be right back i'm not okay bad. okay okay <laughs> how do you navigate rejection no no no, you... no how much would you like just overall life philosophy help helped you navigate the whole thing from college to getting into college and your curiosity and all of that Wow. That was a big, it's a stupid ass. <laughs> it's a bad last question. I was doing well. And then I fumbled it right at the no, goal it's, line. It's it was a huge so question. stupid. <laughs> then it got um, you only have 30 seconds, so go. Okay. I I, I don't know that I've, I've, I'm such a great person that I f figured it out. That's the problem. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I've, d I've done what I've loved to do, I guess. Right. And... Um, I, can, I'd like to point to another book I've been reading real quick. And I, yeah. I talked to you about this the other day, Steve Martin's book, who probably oh, yeah. a lot of people have read. And I really appreciate how, because we're talking about, can you learn comedy? How he went through comedy was like, I want to learn how to play banjo. I want to learn how to do magic. I want to learn how to juggle. And it's like, he just kept learning different skills. And then some of those skills turned into his act and right. some didn't and some he abandoned some he heightened and i would say to everybody just do what you like and you're interested in and enjoy and i bet that incorporates into your act or your comedy or whatever you want that to be and the same could be said with college like i didn't love everything about amherst but i did meet a lot of great people and a lot of classes did inspire me and i still think about and talk about and then, but it was really expensive so i don't know if it was worth it 30 seconds <laughs> Lisa I'll, I'll, Lisa, I'll go to you. Yeah, uh, attitude's everything. I everything. think it's the difference between people who stay with it and keep going and end up working and, and doing what they want and people who feel like they have to quit and give up. If, if it's what you want to do, your attitude is everything. And improv embodies that. You have to have an open mind. Everything's okay. It doesn't matter what was said by the person you're in the scene with, you're going to make it right. And I think it's that attitude and mindset that you need. Incredible. Incredible. I hope you can follow that, Dimitri. Yes. I don't, I don't think I 
quite can, but I, I'm going to shift it because maybe this is my best bet here, which is, I don't know if, if I can speak to attitude as much as I can speak to focus or attention, which I, I would say affects the attitude, but speaking from my own experience so far, and especially as it relates to college, I think I went into college and came out of college a very results-oriented person. Um, finding comedy for me changed the way I looked at things and the way I thought about them and ever since the way I approach kind of everything I do now, mm -hmm. which is to say I moved from results into process and learned to fall in love with a process. Stand up is a repeated uh, series of failures, depending on how harshly you judge yourself. But there, even with a very generous standard, you are failing a lot, especially in the beginning. If I, I think had stuck with a very results oriented outlook, I would have quit long ago. Um, but it forced me, it was the first time I found something I loved that I objectively really sucked at. And I had to sort of reconcile those two things. And it was the best gift ever because everything I've ever tried since, I try to find what in the process speaks to me that is validating and makes me feel like I'm growing, that I like the work and I, I like myself enough when I'm doing it. When the results can be the byproduct of a process that I enjoy, even if I've had to engineer it to some degree, mm -hmm. and I feel like I'm on the right track, whether it's painting, writing music or whatever, however shitty I am at it. If I like right. that process, I feel like I'm having a better life than if I get stuck on the results. And the irony is, as a one-liner comic, the results are every 30 seconds. So I can't really escape the result thing, but right. I can sort of look at the process more. I love it. Well, Lisa, Matt Besser, Dimitri Martin, thank you so much for participating in this. I think we're done. I think we're done. That was incredible, inspiring for me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Wayne, thank you, Wayne. I want to say thanks. And Wayne, nobody asked you any questions. Is there anything... <laughs> Good. You moderated, but is there anything? Yeah, if you want to play the drums, it feels like you kind of set those up. I mean, when I must ask you to play the drums. I'm literally like this. <laughs> no, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We're at, I don't know how to sign off of this. This is my first one doing this online. What what happened? Does that guy, did Alex come back? What happened? Yes, that guy. Is available. <laughs> um, thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. Uh, for everyone still watching, we're back on tomorrow. Our first uh, event is our uh, second block of First Look Comedy Shorts at 9.30, uh, which is gonna lead right into our um, Oki Masters of Comedy Award presentation to Bill Hader at 11. Uh, so I hope you guys will all join us for that. And uh, that's it, good night. Thank you guys so much. Hi, everybody. Thanks. Thanks. See you guys in real life one day. Yeah. <laughs>